Thank you all for being a part of this moment. Thank you, Miriam, Prithika, and Sarah for inviting me here. I was asked to talk with you about sustainability. And I live on a farm, so excuse me for being extremely conscious that there's a lot of light facing me and a black audience that I'm speaking into. So the, I, I'll, choose to exp, uh, to, I'll choose to share with you uh, the way I have understood sustainability through my own life experiences. And what I hope to leave you with are a few fundamental principles. The word sustainability was coined in the 80s, but humans have been sustainable for centuries before that. The difference between then and now was the, the development, the, the discovery of fossil fuels, and um, really a, a shift from a resource-based economy to a cash-based economy. What's also changed is our own need and our own definitions of quality of life. Um, so through the examples, I'd like to illustrate that, um, <laughs> through the examples I'd like to illustrate some, uh, some ideas that will hopefully help you to be able to define your own set of needs and uh, sort of reassess how we, how we create what we define as the quality of our life. I, I grew up in Bombay. I went to school in Fort Convent. I um, studied in the US, uh, environmental studies in Mount Holyoke College and thereafter worked with the US EPA analyzing toxic emissions to air, water, and land. Um, I came back to India to discover myself and to really understand my space with the, my role in this big play called life. I live now on a farm with, uh, which is, I've been living in a farm in rural India for about 11 years. Uh, and I work with tri a tribal community. The farm is self-sustained. We, we uh, we grow, uh, we earn our own income, and the farm supports a tribal community of 10 people who in return support the farm in terms of work. When I came back from the US, I felt really full of myself, and I remember sitting on the farm uh, ready to believe that I had a lot to teach the, the tribal community I lived with. On a hot summer's day, when there's not much land work to do, Mommy and I were sitting on the veranda. Mommy is the eldest lady in our team. And I thought I'd teach her how to, how to sign her name. Um, she'd need it in banking for sure. So I, I, I give Mommy the pencil and I see her Mommy who's a beast in the forest and you put a sickle in her hand and she can take on the whole forest alone. I give her the pencil and she can't grasp she can't hold the pencil. Trying after a few minutes, she throws the pencil down, says this is a mess, and walks away. A little frustrated that mommy didn't want to learn. I, I felt she was a bit close to, to a new experience. Um, I thought there's not, I, I, I just felt frustrated by this. Uh, about a month later, mommy's walking by. She pauses, she looks at the sky, and she says, now the rains will come. And suddenly I realized I, I didn't have that much to teach them. Actually, I didn't know how to tell rain. I didn't know how to douse a wildfire. I didn't know how to grow my own food. I didn't know much, much, much of my own nature. So the first principle I'd like to share with you on sustainability is something that the cows on the land taught me, and that is really interdependence. Uh, being a non-dairy farm, I thought a lot about bringing a cow onto the farm. It's, uh, it takes resources to manage a, a cow, and you know we're not really into milk production. But we invited the cow all the same. On a farm, managing wild grass is pretty time res resource intensive. You de-weed or you br brush cut the, the wild grass, and a brush cutter uses diesel and petrol. What I learned by observing the cows is that the cows munch on the wild grass. Um, as they munch on the wild grass, where they munch on the grass, the grass is actually stimulated by the saliva and the munching of the cow and reproduces much stronger, thus retaining its own space in nature. And the cow, in fact, uh, is fertilizing the, the wild grass that it munches on, thus ensuring its own, its own food for tomorrow. 
the farm is the the cow gives me urine which contains urea which is a key input in farming and a cow less farm needs to purchase this uh, synthesized urea the cows uh, not just ate and pooped and peed all over the farm but uh, being a mango farm um what the mango trees do is they shed their leaves in the summer time and they do that to protect the roots to give them the roots shade the 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 ripe mango would often be tucked underneath leaf litter the cows i found were able to sniff out the ripe mango and in return had taught me to tell me which one of the 500 trees i should start harvesting my mango from fruit flies are a pretty big issue in uh, in fruit orchards what the fruit fly does is it lays its egg in the fallen fruit the egg hatches the the larva buries underground and the fruit the fly emerges with its food right above its head the fruit on the tree farms again cowless farms will need to invest in pesticide and spray this on the trees on your fruit to be able to manage this problem I didn't have to the cows were munching away on the the fallen fruit and thus taking care of this problem for me naturally. You'll see a lot of vacant spaces on the land if you visited our farm. And uh, at for of course I could occupy these vacant spaces with cash crops and increase the financial income of the farm. But what I learned through observation was that the cows were actually um eating i mean what the wild what the wild grass that these vacant spaces held was this neutrally nutritionally diverse platter of food for the cows and what this allowed me is um, and and of course by virtue of having the food for the cows i didn't have to bring in outside inputs if i farmed on these spaces to increase my income i would now interrupt the the cycle of nature Uh, John Muir really beautifully summarizes this uh, this story I've shared. Uh, he, he says, "If you pull on, if you tug on a single string in nature, you'll find it hitched to the entire universe." Just like me in the farm, uh, uh, just like the cows and their place in a, uh, their me questioning the place of a cow in a dairy farm, in a non-dairy farm, we could question the place of trees in a concrete jungle. and here i'd like to take the example of my own father mr anil patia my father worked on a factory uh, pre far from the city and he spent about 3 to 4 hours commuting he uh, in his spare time he started to craft um, a garden in in the lane it's pretty hard to find soil in bombay so what he did was collect bagasse which is the waste product of sugarcane uh bring that in he visited gardens in the monsoon and brought in introduced earthworms he trained the residents of our lane uh with the ideas of separating garbage at so separating wet waste at source which is in the kitchens green bins were kept in the in the build in the compounds of each of the buildings and residents started to bring their wet waste to these green bins the the waste was chopped weekly and mixed in with the bagasse and earthworms so robust was became this program that uh, d road started to absorb the wet waste of three hotels right next door intercontinental marine plaza and the obroy and they did this for 15 years um it's a beautiful example he went on further to tie up with the drug and rehab uh, facility in bombay called sankalp and when drug inmates were ready to reassimilate back into society they were invited to the uh, to the to the lane and trained with my father in these practices many of them returned to their villages with a deep knowledge and experience in creating soil in composting and in organic farming it's a simple uh, it's a beautiful way that a simple idea addressed multiple problems and uh, created you know the the lane ultimately created a third of waste that it was creating just before uh, the the residents all of this cost rupee uh, 50 paisa per family per day the lane was a good 2 to 3 degrees cooler than its neighboring lanes and um, the biodiversity that it hosted was is beautiful the second idea i'd like to the second fundamental principle i'd like to leave you with is that time space and quantity 
is important, especially, especially when we talk about a shared resource. So going back to my, my life on the farm, uh, the, I live with an Adivasi community, and come on soon, they, uh, a species called Kauri, Chlorophytum tuberosum, it, it's the first green species to, to come up from the forest floor. Despite the monsoons coming after a long dry spell when it's really hard to naturally grow greens, the tribal community does not harvest this, this, uh, this plant immediately. Um, the, the story of cowrie is uh, linked on face value with the story of rice. As the monsoons arrive, the farmers sow their first seeds of rice. It takes about two weeks for, for seed to go from seed to sapling, and after which saplings are, uh, are unearthed, and uh, following which is a pretty time and resource intensive, and resource I mean by manpower, intensive uh, practice of standing in ankle deep water, bent over the earth and returning these roots into the soil. All this needs to be done early enough in the monsoon so your crop of rice actually gets a long enough period of rain. So the tribal community comes together and what they do is circle through everybody's, fam everybody's land and the, until everyone's rice is planted. This, this process takes about two to three weeks. When the rice of the entire community is, is transplanted, the village drunk is handed a bottle of booze, and he's tasked with, the, with announcing to the village, tomorrow we eat cowrie. The, the lads of the village go over the hill. Cowrie likes to glow, grow on hill slopes, forest, uh, semi-shaded forest, undisturbed forest hill slopes, and they harvest cowrie. They come back, they share it with families that weren't able to harvest the, the green. Uh, the cowrie is cooked in every household, offered to nature, and from then on, the consumption begins. Interestingly, the time period for rice to go from seed to transplant is completely synchronized with cowrie having reached seed and dispersed its seed. So it seems innate in, the, in our ancient tribal ancestors was the knowledge of the green of cowrie, its cycle of nature, the nutritional density that this green held, but also the need of man and the need of ensuring Kauri remains in the forest to feed tomorrow's man. I'd like to tie in now to an example closer to home. Uh, my own nephew has, is in the 10th grade. He's just completed his 10th grade. And he was handed a, a pair of uh, Bluetooth uh, wireless um, headphones, noise cancellation headphones. Um, they worked really well and he loved these headphones. His parents about, because he always lived in the, with these headphones, his parents, when, when a new, uh, newer technology became available, his parents bought him this sleeker, newer technology headphone. Uh, my nephew politely declined the gift and asked them to return the headphone. He used his current, his original pair for six years until they stopped working. Once they stopped working, he shopped at home and found in his house a perfectly functioning pair of headphones which he used thereafter. The stories of, um, the stories of our, our tribal ancestors, the stories of our ancestors, helped us stay, um, stay in, live in harmony with nature. The word sustainability was coined in the 80s when actually there was an understanding that man is now taking from nature in a way that's not going to leave enough for the next generation. That was the birth of the word sustainability. Today, our generation today no longer has that worry. Actually, the concern today is the sharing of the resources within our own generation. So I, I'd like to leave you, the youth, uh, with this idea that uh, your choices are what matters. Your choices are what makes the supply chain. Um, whether we choose cheese that's imported versus and jam that's imported versus a cheese that's locally grown. An imported cheese will contain chemical preservatives to be able to trans to, to be able to travel through time. It will contain um, a lot of packaging. It'll be it traveled here using fossil fuels. It'll probably have to go through refrigeration. Uh, compare that with the jam we make on the farm. We package it in a glass bottle. It's from the fruits we've grown, and we send it in the, we wrap it around in newspaper and send it to the city in a cloth bag traveled by bus. 
if you've ever re received produce from us, you'll see that it's stacked, uh, leaves like kale and salad leaves are packed in teak, in a teak leaf, which is something grown in the forest that we harvest. The twine of our packaging is uh, the twine of um, the banana plant. And uh, once you unpack, and all of this keeps the produce really fresh, and once you unpack it, you can actually take the entire packaging and compost it. And if you aren't composting al already, everybody should be composting at home. Uh, check out Symbiosis, that's Sim with an I, and they make beautiful, elegant, efficient, um, easy to use compost bins for our city homes. The other thing the youth, we, us youth should really be thinking about is that our choices also end, uh, will, will impact the end of life chain. And what that means is the frequency with which we buy gadgets, where it goes finally. Uh, the, the material used in these gadgets, there's a lot of plastic ending up in our landfills, both in the products as well as in the packaging of the products. So uh, I'd like to leave you once again with a, with a Venn diagram, and I'm using imagination here for you to, for you to, uh, for you to draw your diagrams. Uh, there's three circles. One circle is economic growth. The other circle is environment. And the third circle is social well-being. And the, inter the space where these three circles intersect is the quality of life. And the larger this intersected space, the better the quality of life. Me personally on the farm, I am continuously challenging my own definition of, and deconstructing my own definition of needs. And, um, uh, I guess I'm continuously being made aware and deepening the idea that you cannot adopt a piece without adopting the whole. Thank you. <laughs>